The end times are God's refining process. Little sermon here the Lord laid on my heart. Um, there's a theme that carries throughout the Bible where God is worthy of all the glory. And um, God doesn't ever choose the vast majority of people. He never has and He never will. God chooses a very small number of people. And uh, right now there's a lot of people who claim to believe in God, who claim to believe in a Bible. Some, this Bible, the Word of God, God's perfect Bible in English, the King James Bible. Others use the new versions that come back or go back to the Vatican. But there's a lot of people that say that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Um, God's going to refine that number. Uh, read about it throughout the New Testament, separating the wheat from the tares and, and um, the sheep from the goats and, and things. But you'll see this theme throughout the Bible. So we're going to look at a number of those today in this study and um, see what is coming as a result of this, this thought here of God refining things. Let's start out first in the book of Judges, back in the Old Testament. And um, one of my favorite stories, such an interesting thing here, Judges chapter 7. You know, it's uh, when you truly get saved, you realize how, and the, the more sanctification you go through, you realize how alone you really are. And um, if you haven't seen my one study I did about uh, the saint must walk alone, uh, I did a study about that uh, reading. I think it was A.W. Tozer or something. He wrote this little thing about the saint must walk alone. And and, um, and that was, you know, 100 years ago, whatever. Uh, just amazing. And it applies so much to us today. And I've heard from a lot of you out there, you're alone. You don't have anybody to relate to in your family, in your friends, sometimes even in your own marriage. Uh, you're all alone. And uh, so this study is going to be showing some doctrinal things, but it's also exhortation. I just want to exhort you, my brothers and sisters in Christ out there, to understand why you are alone, why there's not many other people like you, and our, our heart's desire is to fellowship with each other. Um, I wish I could step through the screen and come into your living room there and fellowship with you. And let's sit down and study the Bible together and talk about things, what's going on in your life and whatever else. I can't do that. Um, and you know what would happen if I had some church building someplace and I invited all of you, my faithful viewers, to come to that church building. Well, it would get infiltrated with all the people that hate me. <laughs> you know. Uh, oh, I have 43,000 subscribers. Well, okay, praise the Lord. I, you know, the channel keeps growing okay fine wonderful but uh you know that all those subscribers um if i have 43,000 subscribers i should have 43,000 views per video you know but uh that's not the case uh, a lot of people just come here to see the show i guess or something or you know get involved in the drama that goes on and whatever but uh god chooses a very small group of people um let's look about that Jer or judges Chapter 7, verse 1. Then Jerubabel, Jerubabel, always have a hard time with the names in the Old Testament, who is Gideon, makes it easier, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the wall of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Mori in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me. Too many for me. Well, uh, it's kind of an interesting statement, isn't it? Hey, for my liking, there's too many people. <laughs> hmm. Kind of like the Lord would look down uh, at all the church buildings and say, that's too many. <laughs> you know, like I did a study about the thing of the Catholic Church. They say there's one billion members of the Catholic Church. Well, that's a problem because the angels in heaven, Revelation chapter 5, there's less than 200 million of them. And the entire time of church history. And I believe that those angels are resurrected saints. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Um, the whole big study there. But the whole point is, the Catholic Church is saying we have one billion current living members, and yet the Bible says less than 200 million. Why? Uh, because God looks down and says, uh, yeah, one billion Catholics, uh, that's too many. Too many, not interested. 
Oh, in the Protestant denominations, another couple hundred million or whatever worldwide. Mm, yeah, too many. I want a smaller number. Hmm. Getting back to our text here. Verse 2, like we were reading. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give to the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. You know, it's interesting because that's what the modern church people do. My belief saves me. My church membership saves me. My baptism saves me. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. Okay, now you'd think that they're, you know, afraid? I'm not afraid. I'll serve the Lord. But look what happens. And the return of the people, 20 and 2,000, and there remained 10,000. <laughs> There's 32,000 men there, you know. Hey, if you're afraid, just go home now. Oh, good. Thank you. you know, oh, I didn't really want to fight for the Lord. I, I just, you know, I really just kind of wanted to, you know, look like I was part of the army. Very much like today's church. We'll serve the Lord. We'll boldly proclaim. No one will tell us what to do in our churches. No one can speak here. We have freedom of speech. Shut down. Oh, uh, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I thought you said nobody was going to tell you what to do or close the dirt doors of your churches. And yet they did. Hmm. Too afraid to take a stand? Hey, uh... To come into the store, you have to, you know. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, oh. I, I need to. I have to keep my job. I have to do this thing here. Hmm. Too afraid to trust in God. Interesting. That's, by the way, two-thirds. Okay, a little over two-thirds of the people left. Hmm. Verse 4, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many bring them down under the water and i will try them for thee for thee there and it shall be that of whom i say unto thee this shall go with thee the same shall go with thee and of whomsoever i say unto thee this shall not go with thee the same shall not go so he brought down the people under the water and the lord said unto gideon every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth him shalt thou set by himself likewise every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink and the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men, and all the rest of the people bowed down their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that, lappeth, that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go every man unto his place. So the people took victuals in their hand and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man, unto his tent, and retained those three hundred men, and the host of Midian was beneath him, in the valley. Hmm. Kind of an interesting number. 300 from 32,000. What is that? 10%? Something like that? Hmm. Maybe even less than that. <laughs> uh, kind of an interesting thing because I've often said, you know, I don't believe that there's, you know, the vast majority of Christians, probably 90 plus percent of them, are not saved. Interesting. The Lord looks down and he says, uh, it's too many. I don't want them vaulting themselves. And you know the funny thing? Uh, you get around the church building, modern people and whatever else, they'll brag about their church building. They'll brag at how big it is and how many buses they have and how many people go in Sunday school and how many souls get saved. They brag all the time. Hmm. Almost like they're taking glory away from the Lord. So what's the Lord do? He has to refine that number down. And the Lord's going to do that exact thing right now. Over the next couple of years from now, whenever the catching up happens, I wish it could happen soon, but I think we're going to be here for a few years yet because God has to refine some things. Make it very plain to the lost world who the saved are and who the lost are. I mean, how many people looked at the church buildings as being filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And when 2020 and 2021 came along, their 
suspicions were proved to be correct. If all the church buildings would have said, no, not shutting our doors, no, not happening, we're standing against this thing, our God protects us, our God will preserve us from the common cold, with a new name to it, you know, uh, sorry, uh, disease with 99% recovery rate, uh, you know, our God, I think he can take care of us, you know, no, but they didn't, they went along with it. I stood against it from the very beginning, and a few other brethren did, did too. No, not going to have anything to do with it. Our time will come when God's going to make it plain. You're among my chosen few. Right now it's a little lonely. Right now it's a little hard to go through that. But uh, what the Lord is going to do through you, if you're faithful to him, and through me, if I'm faithful to him, um, it will be worth it when that time comes. Let's go next to Jeremiah chapter 30. The Bible is such an amazing book. The study, you know, sometimes I, Lord puts a study in my mind I need to do or whatever else, and, and I'm really kind of down about it and just down about things in the world and whatever else. And I start to study for my study, <laughs> and I actually am encouraged, uh, not by my own thoughts or anything else, but by the Word of God. Brings me back in line with where I'm supposed to have my mind, Re, you know, renewing your mind. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12. But the time of Jacob's trouble, which you read about in Jeremiah chapter 30, right, verse 7, is where it talks about the time of Jacob's uh, trouble, you know, for Israel in the future. But what's the point of it? What is, what's the whole purpose for the time of Jacob's trouble? Is it for the re refining of the church? No, that's this time. The beginning of sorrows, I believe, is for the refining of the church before we go and get caught up. We're to be presented as a chaste virgin to Jesus Christ. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 10 through 11. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and shall be in rest and be quiet and none shall make him afraid. That's pretty good for the Jews, isn't it? Keep reading, though. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. Still pretty good, but keep reading. But I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. The Lord loves the Jews. He has a, relation, or he has a, a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants, physical descendants. Well, who are the Jews? Are they, you know, Khazarians? Are they Ashkenazi? Are they all this other stuff? The Lord knows. He knows who they are. You, ever, you know, it's so weird. All these people that come up with all this anti-Semitic stuff. Oh, there are no real Jews. Or maybe it's the, you know, the 12 tribes are actually, you know, 12 European nations. Or maybe they're black people and Indian Native American people. and what it, They can't be the people that are in Israel. You know, the, yes, the nation of Israel came back, and that's fulfilling Bible prophecy, but it, they can't be the real Jews over there because we know that they're just fakes and whatever else, and, and we can prove this, we can prove that. Uh, so uh, you don't think God can preserve them? You don't think God knows who is who over there? I think the Lord knows. Okay? And the fact that so many people hate them over there tells me, yeah, that's the Jews. They've come back. Um, not all of them. There's some fake ones there, obviously. But the real Jews are over there, and here in America and in a few other countries, that God's going to drive them out of those countries. So why would he do a horrible thing like that? <clears throat> I mean, they're here in America. They're protected here in America. Why would God be so horrible that he'd let a bunch of them get killed with a second Holocaust coming soon to drive them out, drive them back to Israel? Why would he do a thing like that? Why did he do it in Nazi Germany? Why is he going to do it here in America? Um, well, because of Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 11. God makes a full end of all the nations. And he's going to not make a fool into the Jews, but he's going to correct them. He's going to refine them. Hmm. Daniel chapter 12. <clears throat> the book of Daniel chapter 12. Verse 9 through 10. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. 
Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You want to be wise, then you better fear God. You say, I don't fear God, I don't even believe that God exists. Well, then you're not wise. You can claim to be wise. You might have some knowledge, head knowledge, but you're not understanding what's going on. You have no wisdom. You don't look at this world and see things. There's a lot of people that think right now that the economy is better than it's ever been. <laughs> As inflation is going through the roof and interest rates for home mortgages and things are going up. A, they've gone up, you know, I think for seven weeks straight or something. I was literally in the bank the other day and they had a radio on and they said the interest rates are going up for the seventh week in a row or something, you know. How's the economy doing? Better than ever, you know. <laughs> We're 30 trillion in debt here in America and other countries are falling apart and they're starting to ration food and gas prices are so much that people can barely afford it, but it's better than it's ever been. <laughs> well, uh, many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. We can look at things, we can, the wise, those that are truly saved, we can look and say, yeah, you know, I mean, and he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. How could you explain what's going on right now to some guy that was living before Christ showed up on the earth? You know, back in the B.C. years, you know, where Daniel was living. How in the world would you explain this world to him? I mean, you could take him forward in a, in a time machine or whatever, which I think he was probably shown some things there in terms of, you know, he was seeing, he was seeing visions of the end times. And that's why he's sitting astonished. You know, he's just sitting there. And he's saying, what in the world? How could people get that stupid? I can't fathom it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm 46 years old. I'll be 47 this year. And I can look at people and I just think, what is in the world? For weird, do you think, you know, seeing people walking by, just looking at a little piece of metal and plastic and, and some glass and, you know, Not even paying attention when they're going. Sitting on the porch. Driving in the vehicle. Is it that important to be on that thing all the time? Cell phone, if you don't know what I'm talking about. I mean, it just crazy. What's going on? The vast majority of these people are going to die. The vast majority of the people in this world right now are slated for destruction. And we're just, if you're saved, if you're born again, you understand what's going on. You're, you're getting into natural health, maybe not an expert on it or anything, but you're, you, you believe that the King James Bible is God's book and you're looking into things and studying this and studying that. And you're looking at, you just, oh, I can't believe it's just, this is insane. You can tell it's just leading up to some very bad things. And you, yeah, well, that's what the Bible teaches. <laughs> Going to be a refining process. You meet a bunch of these uh, professing Christians out there and you start talking to them about, you know, things and they say, well, I wouldn't be so negative. And, well, that depends on how you look at it. And I mean, we could agree to disagree on vital doctrines and, and all this other stuff. And I, I don't know. I just don't. I think you're being a little bit too negative and you're thinking, what? You can't see this stuff? What? Uh, huh? I mean, you know. Back when I was a boy, lost people could fool you much better. You know, they were a lot more like Christians and things, and it was a lot harder to tell who's who back then. And you go back even before I was born, you know, some of my older viewers, you go back to your childhood, and you're probably thinking, yeah, it was even worse back then. I mean, there was a lot of really nice people. People were proper. You didn't hear the F word when you're out walking around in a store. You'd, you didn't hear a bunch of loud rock music playing while you're trying to buy groceries. And, you know, I, just now it's so obvious who's lost and who's saved. And, you know, you look in these, you see these people and you just think, okay, I'm living in the heathen jungles or something here. I mean, what in the world? What's going on? Oh, God's refining things. Zephaniah, the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3. 
head towards the New Testament. If you're newly saved, you don't know your Bible yet, head towards the New Testament, a couple books over, and you'll find the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations. God is bringing in the new world order. What? Huh? Keep reading. He'll tell you why. That I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. You know, God's a jealous God. He has every right to be. He created this earth. He, he's the one that says, you know, this is what you do. This is what you don't do. Writes a book and says, don't add to it or subtract from it. And people come along and say, oh, no, I, I'm just going to do that. Uh, I'm going to make my own version here and take this out and put this in. And I'll call it God's word. And you get preachers up in the pulpit. I believe that this book here is God's word. But a better translation would be, actually, if you go back to the Greek, the word, let me clarify the King James Bible with the Greek. You just called it God's word. If it's God's word, you can't clarify it. You accept it for what it says. You don't change it for any reason. But uh, God, in his jealousy, he looks down here and he says, I'm the one that deserves the glory. That's my book right there. I wrote about what I'm going to be doing in the future. Oh, you, you're not in line with that? Then you're going to be devour, devoured with my fire my anger, my wrath that's coming. Verse 9, For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. I've preached that thing over the years, many years now since I've been in ministry. Calling upon the name of the Lord is how you get saved. Right, you believe what the Bible says, you call upon the name of the Lord. You want to be in contact with the guy who wrote the book. You know, um, I have some questions with uh, a book that I'm reading. Well, what should you do? Get in touch with the author. He can, you know, ask him the questions and things about it. Oh, no, no, I just read the book and I believe what's said in there and everything else. Don't need to talk to the author. It'd be kind of weird if, you, if he's willing to talk to you. I understand some authors, a lot of them are busy. I get it. But, you know, God is willing to listen. Why wouldn't you want to call upon him? Bizarre. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. We'll go here, and this is the judgment of the nations that we're going to be reading about. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through 46. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, I believe that's redeemed saints. Uh, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat, I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee an hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Notice that there's no faith there. They're looking at Jesus physically sitting on his throne in Jerusalem as where this ultimately is going to happen. Uh, they're seeing him. There's no faith. Jesus doesn't say, well, you put your faith in me that I shed, you know, the, the blood that I shed on the cross and the, the whole, my death, burial, resurrection. You get to this time period here at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, they're judged purely on their works because they've seen enough there. The Bible's come true. It's, the mystery of God is finished during the time of Revelation, so there's no more faith there. It's not grace through faith from Genesis to the end of Revelation. That's not true. That's a false prophet type of thing that these guys will say. It's all works when you get to the end here. 
I mean, prove me wrong. I've offered that, and people never were able to take, you know, me up on that. Uh, where's faith at? It's not there. So, well, they had to have faith while they were doing those things and whatever else that God was going to come back and things. Well, that's not really the, the faith of things, you know, not being seen. They're seeing the events of Revelation unfolding. And God doesn't judge them on faith. He doesn't say, hey, you, had, you believed in me that whole time. You had faith in me that I was going to come back. And went. They know he's coming back. That's why they're there doing those things. So, just an interesting thing there. Let's look at uh, verse 41 through 46. Then shall he also say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then, he shall, then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Again, notice the two distinctions there, the two opposites. Group A, the sheep. You did these things. You helped out other people and whatever else. Group B, you didn't do those things. It's not, well, he judges them by faith and works, you know, the group A, the sheep, but the goats, group B, um, they, you know, they, they did, are judged because they, they didn't do the works, but they, you know, it was mainly because of the faith thing. Faith is never mentioned. The Lord doesn't say, hey, depart from me, you cursed, because you didn't believe in me. You didn't believe in what I did on the cross. and That's not there. That's why it's so important to rightly divide the word of truth. I get these people and they'll write me this, you know, condescending comments and whatever letters and things I get in the mail sometimes. And people write and they'll say, You're, you've come a long way, Brian. But, uh, you know, if you really want to graduate and be a real preacher, um, I suggest you give up the dispensational thing and then you'll understand the Bible correctly. <laughs> Just thinking... <laughs> Uh, no. Um, if I wanted to be a, a, you know, a little novice in Scripture, I would give up dispensationalism. Uh, that's not going to happen, ever. I will never give up dispensational teaching because it's been proved to be right. So, people, sometimes these people just amaze me. Finally, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4. God's going to refine some things, brethren. If you get there to the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, it's not going to be easy for them to be doing those things. Visiting people in prison and clothing people and feeding them and, you know. But uh, will it be worth it? Mm hmm Yeah. Come into the kingdom here. He made it through all that stuff. I mean, you talk about a hard bunch of individuals. Some real true men and real true women that make it through that time there. You know, the whole way through the time of Jacob's trouble. Somehow he got through the thing without ever taking the mark of the beast. Seven years of that. You know, I mean, the Lord can provide for those people, but you still, I just, man, you know, survivalist, extreme, super soldiers or whatever else these people will be. Made it seven years not taking the mark of the beast. Seven years of not losing their faith in the Lord and his word and watching things happening and whatever else, you know, I mean, they're seeing it. So like I said, you can't live, you know, faith is the evidence of things not seen. It's not the same faith that we have, but you know, understand what I'm saying there. Um, seven years of that and they get through it and the Lord doesn't say, well, you know, okay, well, you did okay. All right. You know, go on this, you can die now or whatever. Come on into the kingdom. And for you and for me, hey, you went through some pretty rough times down there. Boy, you sure got kicked around a lot by family and friends and people, and everybody thought you were weird and all this other stuff. You might even get beat up or whipped or shot at or whatever. Maybe some of us might get martyred. I don't know. But you go through all of it, and the Lord says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Come on into heaven. I have some rewards for you at the judgment seat of Christ. I saw what you did down there. You did a lot for me. 
I'm going to give you some rewards for that now. That's what we need to look forward to. Let God refine us. God's going to refine the lost away from us, but you know what? Like I said, God has to refine you and me too. And you'll be amazed sometimes you'll live 10, 12 years as a saved Christian and all of a sudden the Lord will say, hey, you know what? That's displeasing to me. It needs to go. I never knew that, Lord. I mean, I've said this in different studies, but you know, it, I never knew that. I didn't know that that was wrong. I didn't. That's the origin of that? I had no idea that that... Oh, I'm sorry, Lord. I need to get rid of that thing. He's refining. And the end times, that refining process gets taken to a whole new level. Nonconformity. How about that one in the last two years? God wants us to be nonconformists. Hmm. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is gl glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Read that one yet, too. It's a good one. But uh, verse 17, we say, well, the Lord's going to judge the house of God. He's going to judge the, these church buildings out there. Well, they're not technically part of the house of God. Uh, house of God is... You and me, those of us that are born again, those of us that are saved, living by the truth. God's going to judge us. He's talking about the righteous, those who he has redeemed. Judgment begins at us. And so what we need to do, brethren, is we need to examine ourselves and say, you know what, Lord, if there's some sin in me, if there's some sin in my life, please, Lord, help me to refine this out. And you know how you refine something, by the way? through heat. You need to purify it. You take some gold, some gold nugget that you found out there in the river or whatever else, you know. That'd be nice, but you go out there, you take that gold. That gold has impurities on it and probably in it. And you take it and you heat it up. And guess what? The dross comes up to the surface. The other minerals, other metals, other dirt little rock pebbles or whatever comes up you scoop that off the top and you heat it up some more and you heat that gold up until it's refined and then you can pour it out and then you can use it God might have to heat things up for us brethren maybe he'll heat it up for you um, I wish I could stand here and tell you that uh, after all these years I've got all my sins I have victory over and everything else, and I am sinlessly perfect. Like a lot of people say that I teach, <laughs> uh, I've never taught that. I'm not sinlessly perfect. There's still a few things I have to kind of refine out and whatever else, and I'm saying, okay, Lord, help me with this. And um, I've seen over the years, by the way, too, that uh, there are certain things that God is, is patient with, and He'll just kind of say, come on, I want you to do this. And there are other times... There's no patience with God. And he just comes along and says, this is how it's going to be right now. And he makes something happen. Um, I had to get away from my family because they were bringing me down. They were causing me to compromise on different things, different areas. And um, I didn't know how I was going to do it. I really didn't. And I just thought, well, you know, I'm too weird to get married. Uh, I mean, literally I had a, a mother that was 
a big fan of the ministry and everything else, and, and um, she was really blessed by some of the preaching that I was doing back at the time. And she had two daughters, two single daughters, and um, they were kind of conservative, somewhat Mennonite, but not full-on Mennonite. Again, I've told this story before, and I'm repeating it for newer viewers. And uh, she said, you know, I've talked to my daughters and, and everything, and, uh, you know, they really would like to get married, and, and you can kind of pick take your pick there, you know, which one would you like to contact and whatever. And she sent me a picture with both daughters, and they were very pretty girls. And I thought, this is good, you know, conservative girls and the whole deal. Long hair, long dresses, you know, and things. And I thought, hey, you know, this will work out nicely. I mean, kind of an arranged marriage, I guess, if you will. It wasn't really arranged. I mean, it's not that they had to marry me or anything, or I had to marry them. It was just, you know, here you go. This will be nice. We put you in contact. You can start to talk and travel to meet each other and the whole deal. And um, so I said, you know, I, I think the older one's actually prettier. You know, we're kind of joking around about the thing of Rachel and Leah, you know, that I would, you know, why one of the younger one, the younger sister and the older one's kind of in the way she should be married first. But I actually thought the older one was prettier. And uh, and so, you know, I wrote back. I said, oh, you know, I'd, I'd love to be able to talk to her. And she said, well, let me you know, present it to them and I'll let them hear some of your preaching and get an idea and whatever else. And as a couple of days later, she wrote back, I'm so sorry, Brother Brian. They both think that you're too militant. <laughs> you know, they think you're crazy. Uh, neither one's interested in you. Okay, well, you know, that's about right. Um, yeah. And uh, secular girls, once they found out what I was, oh, you know, look at the time. I have to go <laughs> And so I just thought, you know, I'd like to be able to be stronger for you, Lord, but I just don't know how I'm going to get out of this situation, living with my family and whatever else. And, and all of a sudden, Lord brought my wife along. And I just, I dedicated myself, said, I'm just going to serve you, Lord, to the best of my abilities. And I'll just be single. I don't know how I'm going to work everything out, but whatever. In comes my wife. Family problems get started, which were already there. She didn't cause them. It's, they were already there. She just kind of, you know, exacerbated the problems. And, um, you know, the wound was already there. She just was kind of the salt that brought it in to irritate the wound. And so big family split up. We left. We went here. We went there. Came up here to Maine, and we've been living here since, you know, 2014. Uh, January 2014. So, uh had a lot of good times, uh, my wife and I. I love her very dearly. But uh, just amazing how the Lord refined things and how the Lord continues to refine. Um, so uh, I don't know what the future holds in terms of, I know it's the catching up is, is the next big event for us, the body of Christ, but um, I don't know how bad things will get before we go up. But I do know one thing. It's going to be time for some refining to be done. And the judgment is going to begin with you and me. So, next study I'm going to be doing is on the famine that's coming. So, please stay tuned for that one. And uh, I guess that's going to be it for now. And uh, I always forget to say this, but if you know if you like the video, then go ahead and do the like thing and whatever, and hit the like button, leave a comment, uh, good or bad. Um, the bad comments, you might end up in one of my uh, insane, weird, funny comment videos where I read people's strange comments. I've been getting some good ones again, so I'm kind of building back up to maybe another funny comment video. Uh, I get some really weird people coming along. So please leave all the weird comments you want if you hate my guts and whatever else. If you're one of the people that obsessively makes videos about me, have some guts and actually make a comment. Um, that'd be fun. So... Uh, we will see you in the next study, and thank you to everybody out there for your prayers. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17-18. through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com 
or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.